You're listening to The Recovered Life Show, the show that helps people in recovery live their best recovered lives. And here is your host, Damon Frank. And welcome back to The Recovered Life Show. Uh, We have a very special edition of The Recovered Life Show today. And I have some guests that are joining us. We're talking about the tipping point, the decision to get sober, making that decision to get sober. I am thrilled to be joined today uh, by Recovered Life Coaches, Jeff Graham, Jennifer Salzman, and Holly Maddox. Welcome, guys, to the show. Hey, Damon. It's good to be here. Good to Good to see everybody. Uh, so we're going to jump right in here. Um, I'm so glad to have you all here because you have a lot of combined experience on this topic about getting sober, being sober. Uh, and, you know, one of the hard things I think for people is making that decision, right? There's a lot that goes into making that decision. Obviously, anybody who's making a decision to get sober has gone through a series of things emotionally, questioning themselves. Hey, uh, does alcohol and drugs work for me? Should I be, you know, should I still be doing this? And that inner fight. So I wanted to have this discussion today with the experts here, with the coaches that really deal with this hands-on and have also been through it, right? Have also been through this themselves. Um, Holly, I want to go to you first. Um, what do you think, what, why is there such a barrier to get sober for people to make this decision, because obviously if you ate strawberries, let's say every day, and it really, and you know, you broke out in handcuffs and it really didn't work for you. You just, you'd quit. You wouldn't even think about it. You wouldn't, you know, why is it so tough for people to make this decision? Um, I think it plays a lot on the stigma um, that's behind it. Um, When you have to get sober, you have to be honest with yourself and you have to be honest with the people around you. I know for me, when I got sober the first time, I was hiding it from my family and friends. So when I had to ask for help, I had to be very vulnerable and and let that side of me show. Um, I think some of the patients that I work with, they can't do it because it's a financial burden. Um, And it's it's like a catch-22, like you're spending a lot of money um, on drugs and alcohol, But they think, oh, but that gets me through the day in order to go to work. But if I have to go to like a rehab or, you know, have to step away and kind of detox, um, that takes away from, you know, going to work. So it's a financial burden, you know, on their families. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, Jeff Graham, I know, you know, I've heard your story about your you personally getting sober and then going into coaching. You know, as a as a guy, I think one of the things that was a hard decision for me was is like, look, guys just don't admit defeat. <laughs> That's just something that you, you know, I know in my household, like you just didn't do that. There was a few things that you don't do as a guy. And one, you just don't say you can't do something, right? You figure it out. Um, and I think that was a big barrier to me getting sober. Do you find that as well, uh, working with people is that they really just don't want to say that they're you know, look, alcohol and drugs has them beat. Well, you know, you're you're dead on right there. There's a bunch of reasons. A lot of it also is is the comfort zone. Um, It it was uh, drinking was something I did for a long, long time. And even though there was a lot of negative from it, it it was it was as crazy as it sounds. It was a safe place for me. I, I, I didn't like it, but I knew what to expect and I knew I could for the most part, handle it. Uh, you know, it, it's, um, I don't know if you've ever seen rescue dogs that have been mistreated their whole lives. They'll, they'll, they'll see, they'll release them at the doors to the cage where they see other dogs running around in the grass, having fun, but the dog won't come out of the cage, even though they, they, it, they see something that looks fun and a safe place, place they want to be. They, they hesitate to come out of their cage. That is how a lot of people are with, um, with making the commitment to sobriety. It's, 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 it's a fear of the unknown. It's a fear of change. Um, it, it's something that we've been used to for so long and to have to admit that, you know, open that door and create a vulnerability of stepping outside is very difficult. 
Yeah, abs- absolutely. You know, I think that initial decision to that tipping point, I remember that very clearly about, you know, kind of in the back of my mind, it was like a tidal wave building up, right? I knew something was wrong. I then had pieced together that alcohol was that something, but I just really, it, it took almost like a building up point for me to get to a decision where I could actually say, hey, you know what, maybe this is an issue. Jennifer, um, you know, my question to you is, is that what do you think it is uh, with alcohol and drugs specifically that people really don't understand addiction? You know, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about doctors and about how really doctors really have like no training in uh, in in drug and alcohol abuse, like like an hour or two. Right. Um, what do you think it is about alcohol and drugs where people might actually you know, if it is something else in their life might be quicker to admit that they have an issue with it and they're powerless. What do you think it is actually about drugs and alcohol that people really struggle with? Well, when it comes to alcohol, I mean, it's so normalized, right? You cannot leave your house without being bombarded with messages about how amazing alcohol is and that you need it for, you know, a fulfilling social life and, you know, you need it to, to live. And so once you sort of realize that it isn't serving you, it's actually causing more harm than good, you're different, right? There's something wrong with you. And it's hard to really make that decision that you have to change when you say, oh, I should stop drinking. I'm drinking too much versus I must like this is causing some serious problems in my life. So I think that because it just seems so normalized and everybody else can drink normally. How come I cannot? Yeah. And what's wrong with me? Exactly. I think that whole (laughs) normalization thing is like, why can't I do it normally? You know, one thing I'm going to throw out here is that I I don't know about your guys' experience, but mine was, I think deep down inside, I wasn't quite sure if I could really quit drinking. Like I knew I wanted to, there was a point where I knew I wanted to quit drinking. And then there was a time where I wasn't quite sure if I'd be able to pull that off because I had tried by myself so many times and, and that didn't work. I was very hesitant about coming out and saying, you know, yeah, I'm an alcoholic because that kind of, for me meant too, that I had to kind of stick to that. Right. Like I had to actually make this happen. Do you, do you feel a lot of people struggle with that or did you struggle guys, guys with that? Well, there was a, there was a ton of, um, you know, you talk about the bad of alcohol. If, if I hated everything about it, it probably would be, would have been pretty easy to quit. But there was a lot of things I really liked about drinking. It, it, there, there was that that relief at the end of a of a crappy day. Um, what was instant? It worked. I had some great uh, great times with alcohol, but it got to the point where the the negative was outweighing the good. So it's not something that was just a matter of uh, my my pain had to get had to surpass the good. And that didn't happen overnight. That was a slow thing. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to give up the good. I wanted to stop the problems. I wanted to quit the regret. So I wanted to quit all the, the negatives that came with it. But I did not, I'll be honest, I didn't want to let go of the um of the good. And that's that's uh that's the decision. That's a tough problem because you're you're saying goodbye to someone or something that has been a valued friend for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know, um, you know, Jennifer, I don't know what your experience was in Holly, but like alcohol, like Jeff saying, alcohol worked for me very well for a, it was a solution for a long period of time. And I think for most people, if you're listening to this and they're trying to, you know, maybe you stumbled upon this video on YouTube or you went to our website and you're trying to make that decision, right? Whether you should do it. I, I think it is tough. Like what Jeff was saying, because it did work for me for a long time until the the bad really outweighed the good. Jennifer, what was your experience with that? It took me eight years to finally stop drinking. I thought about it for eight years. You know, I knew it was a problem, but it's still, like Jeff said, you know, there was some benefit that I was getting from it. Not sure what that was, but it was just, you know, the socializing, I guess it was 
coming home after a long day of work and it would just allow me to numb out and not deal with the stress of the day. But it's like being in any toxic relationship. I mean, how many times have you been in a relationship with a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a significant other where <laughs> things are not going well, but it's not just easy to pack up your stuff and leave, right? You have to weigh the pros and cons and you still have love for this person. So, you know, I kind of relate it to any type of toxic relationship where it's like, you know, for a long time that it is not doing you any favors, but it's really hard to make that ultimate decision. Like I need to do what's best for me. So. Absolutely. I think, I think, you know, that's that critical moment. I talk with a lot of people that are alcoholics that can remember the time when they actually made that decision, that it was actually the tipping point. I remember I was at a phone booth on Geary street in San Francisco when I actually made the decision that I was going to, you know, I was going to make an attempt here at least to figure out what was going on. And for me, that was a big deal. Holly, how, how did that work for you? What was your take? Did you have multiple tipping points or was it one big tipping point? Um, <clears throat> My biggest tipping point was coming when I went to rehab for drugs. And then I didn't think I was an alcoholic years later and took many years to try and control, um, you know, drinking normally. Um, and like everyone else has mentioned, fitting in socially and not wanting to admit that, you know, I had the problem and I thought I was snowballing everybody. I thought no one realized what I was, but you know, I'm like falling down and no one else is. Um, so I, again, wanted to hold on to that fun times, but it really was not turning into fun times at all. Um, tipping point was, I, I there's more consequences that I was facing, you know, possibly, well, I did lose a marriage and possibly losing my house and my children and, and, it, you know, jobs, like all of those consequences that start to come um, into the forefront. And that's what I was facing. And I didn't want to. Yeah. I mean, I think the consequences is something that obviously, you know, I think consequences alone uh, doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, necessarily pull you over the top. It's got to be, you know, the consequences and the other things it's like right. building up. I know for me, but I think consequences are big. And I think a lot of people get sober because of that. You know, I want to throw this question out here. Um, I think a lot of people think that when they get sober, uh, it's pretty much the end like of their life. Like that's it. No more fun. Uh, no more friends. Uh, no more anything, right? Like I know for me, cause I got sober in my twenties, like I was terrified. I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to ever be able to be in business, which I want to go into because how can I do this sober, right? This idea of not being able to live your life sober, like how in the heck are you going to do that? I mean, don't you think that's kind of a common fear that people have and how do they combat that? If that, if that comes up. Well, so, so it, when you say the words or the, the phrase stop drinking, um, the word stop what color is that that's that's red that's a that's a red light and and um that's that's a hard one for me sobriety scared the hell out of me i thought it meant stopping it stopped i stopped socializing i stopped having fun i stopped enjoying tailgating at games i stopped uh, a lot of things i now realize that sobriety actually was completely a green light and gave me a go and gave me the go ahead to enjoy things that I had forgotten that I could do. I had forgotten how to dream. I had forgotten how to have fun without alcohol. I forgot a lot of these things were possible. I, I got to the point where I had to trust those of you that said this was good. And I had to roll the dice because I didn't believe it. To the point where I was kind of getting out of options. And I had to, I had to roll the dice and try it. And that's the only one bit of advice I'll give people is you can always go back. If this doesn't work out, if sobriety is not your, 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 your deal, I guarantee the grocery store will still sell you whatever you need. They, they'll be there for you. You can always go back, but why not give yourself the opportunity to experience something, give yourself the chance, the choices to decide. But I, I had to be, I got to the point where I had to trust you, you three that were telling me that this was actually, there'd be a smile on my face at the end of it before I believed it. 
Yeah, I'm sure yeah. glad trust I trust is a, sure glad trust I trust is a you. big thing, right? Trust is a big thing. Holly, what about you with trust? Did you have issues with trust when you came in? Like, are you know, is this really going to work for me? It, you know, can I really trust the people that are around me? And 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 are they telling me the truth? I you know, I just remember saying this has got to be one big scam. People can't be this happy. There's no way that this is uh, real. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess so. It, you know, like my story is a little bit, I mean, or my, my journey is a little bit different. Like I got sober originally. So I had a taste of sobriety for five years before I picked up a drink again, you know, into my marriage. So I had a taste of sobriety. So I knew what sobriety had to offer. But, you know, in, when I originally got sober from, you know, harder substances, um, yeah. I was in my twenties too. And I was like, I'm never going to have fun. How can you go to a concert without smoking pot or, or, you know, taking a hit of acid or mushrooms or, you know, something along those lines. But I learned very quickly that I remembered the concerts then I wasn't in a complete fog or a blackout when I would attend concerts or, you know, any of these functions. Ex you know, exactly. I what real friends were too, you know, like the friends that were like, I don't have to have a drink. Let's go. Let's go do something. You know, I don't have to have a drink. Those were the real friends. Those are the people that wanted to spend time with me instead of it was just a companion to partake in drinking or drugs or something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what? I, I definitely feel like I've had that. I've had that exact same experience. You know, Jennifer, I was going to ask you um, what, you know, what happens is when I think my experience, when you get sober, you find out all kinds of stuff about yourself and all kinds of stuff about the world. You had no idea, you know, I, we, I, that were going on. I mean, I call it being awake, aware and alive. You know, what's some of the things that you discovered about yourself when you got sober or when you're working with clients that they discover about themselves that they had no idea was out there or possible. Yeah. I always thought I had social anxiety. But turns out I didn't. <laughs> I actually have way more fun when I'm at social events now than I ever did when I was drinking because I'm present, because I actually have conversations that I remember. And I also, one of the most amazing things in sobriety is noticing the little things. Like, because when you're drinking, not, all, not only are you numbing stress, anxiety, pain, whatever it may be, you're also numbing joy and happiness mm -hmm. and true fun. So it's like, I'll be walking my dog outside and just, you know, feeling the wind, the sunlight, seeing him breathe and sniff. It's like, it's joyful, just like the world around you. And those are things that I never experienced when I was drinking because I was all in my head and, or I was numb or I was just, you know, I was out of it. So it sounds corny, but I mean, the joy of being sober is real. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's interesting. You you realize how bad it actually was, right? After you get sober for a while and you, and especially I think when you see new people that are, that are coming into recovery, you're like, wow. Like I remember, wow, it was really that bad. I think, you know, somebody mentioned here about you're seeing alcohol ads everywhere and it's the holidays right now. And that's all you see really like on cable TV. I was watching a show. It's just, it, they're all having a great time. It's working really good. Alcohol rarely did that for me. You know, sure. um, it was definitely an escape, but it, it didn't look like that. Right. Um, how do you, as coaches, when you're working with people, because I know you all work with people that are new to sobriety. They're decide they've made that decision, that tipping point, and now they're committing to a coach because they want to make sure that they're going to follow through and be accountable and get that right information. What advice do you give people uh, that want to stay sober long term? Right, they've come in, they realize, yep, alcohol and drugs is an issue, um, and now I need to pursue that. What, what's your first month advice for them? Uh, in the whole recovery process. Be kind to yourself, you know? So like, like Jennifer was saying, all those feelings, once you take alcohol or drugs or whatever substance away, you feel all those feelings, good, bad, all this stuff. And, and if you're patient and, and you just like let them come, cause they'll come and they will go. So being kind to yourself and just, you know, 
as the old saying goes, you know, taking one day at a time, you know, uh, I think it's important to not be like, oh my gosh, I have to fix this and this and this. And, you know, I, I love, I don't know who said it, but I've heard it many times before. Like when we worry and, and have anxiety, we're thinking into the future. And when we're sad and mourning something that's, you know, we're, we're living in the past. So, you know, like rem remembering to live in the day and be in the moment, whether it's good or bad, you know, it's all going to pass, but you just have to know. I always tell my kids this. I'm like, where are your feet? You know, like look down at your feet. Um, Cause once you get one day, then it's two days and you build on it. You know, like I think everyone's so projecting into the future and they're like, Oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get through the next Christmas? You know, exactly. Without a drink. Exactly. Well, let's get through this one first. You know, I like, have a good like, friend uh, who he, he got sober in his thirties and he had young children and, uh, one of his big things that he said, Hey, I can't, I can't get sober because I have to walk my daughter right. down the aisle when she gets yeah. married. And, and if it's like your daughter's eight, like it's right. not, you know, this isn't going to happen right now. How Jennifer, how do you deal with uh, people who have a hard time staying in the present? Right. It's just like, there's so much future tripping about what's actually going to happen in the next, you know, week, two weeks, month that they really can't stay in the moment. Celebrate the little wins every mm. moment when you, when five o'clock comes and that was your normal time to like pop open that bottle of wine and sit in front of the TV and numb out for the night and you choose not to do it. Give yourself a pat on the back, high five yourself, you know, look in the mirror and say like, I love you. Mm. You got this. You know, it's that self compassion, that self love and realizing that, you know, as long as you stay present, as long as you celebrate these tiny little wins that you have throughout the day, all of a sudden it's the next day and you didn't drink, you didn't use drugs. And so you have to really congratulate yourself for that every single day. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think that's so important is to, you know, really pat yourself on the back for the wins. If you wake up sober, no matter what you did the day before, you're just one day closer, right? You're just there. And that's so, it's so, I think, important. I mean, it's so easy to lose sight of actually, you know, that, wow, that's a big feat. Like, I've been able to stay sober for a day, two days, three days. And, uh, you know, Jeff, I was going to ask you in closing here, uh, for people who are sitting there thinking, you know what, is this really worth it? Is this really, like, this sounds like what they're talking about is a lot of work here. It, 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 is getting sober really worth it? What would be your answer to that? Uh, that that has to come from the individual, and that that comes from um, talking, writing, and listening. I, I think we have to know what's in what's in our hearts and what our current situation is to understand if it's worth giving it a shot and and understanding, looking at, at only where we are which can be very self-defeating, but looking at where we want to be and what we would like to, what we would like to envision for ourselves and our loved ones and giving that a sh shot. I, I, I think uh, Jennifer was talking about that, that moment. And I remember the moment that I was out when it clicked, when I realized I was having as much fun as I ever, th that I thought I could only have when I was drinking and I was out and I realized that life was, as as good as I had hoped or maybe had forgotten that it could be without alcohol. And 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 that's I just I I I hope people are willing to give themselves a give it a shot because you have no idea. And I don't think there's anyone that's in recovery that's saying they regret doing it. I don't think there's no, anyone you're gonna that, find right? that says, <laughs> I'm sorry that I did this and my life is really dull and boring and <laughs> unhappy. I Right. really doubt you're going to find anyone. So give yourself the gift of, of tasting it and make the, and make the decision. This isn't a commitment. It's not a tattoo that you'll never be able to get rid of. Give yourself yeah. the option to try both and make the choice. You owe it to yourself and your loved ones. 
Absolutely. I mean, Jennifer, I, I think your advice would be similar to Jeff's, right? I mean, your life's really just beginning. I think, you know, I thought, okay, my life has ended. This is over now. Uh, but really, that wasn't the case. Your life's just beginning when you get sober. I've never said I'm never drinking again. I have never said that. I just don't want to. I drink as much mm -hmm. as I want, which is zero. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, thinking never again is a scary thought. I mean, you never know that you're never going to drink again until you're no longer on this earth. So, you know, you got to take it one day at a time and realize, and every day you're further away from the substance, life gets better and better. So is it worth it? I mean, I can't, I'm a different person since I mm -hmm. removed drugs and alcohol from my life. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is really the big, that is really the, the big transformation thing. I mean, one of the great things about having the show and being involved in recovery is if you're a transformation junkie, this is the place to be, right? Because you definitely see people, you know, you definitely see people transform that you never really think that they will, but they do right in front of your eyes. You know, Holly, in closing here, looking back at your own life here, uh, the things that you were the most afraid of, when you look at those now and getting sober, what do you feel about those things that you were the most afraid of? Uh, how do you feel about those now? Um, like Jennifer was saying, I celebrate those wins. I, I, I became a completely different person. I tested my ability and my independence and you know, I never thought I'd be capable of, you know, owning my own house and taking care of all the bills and the maintenance. And um, like my washing machine was leaking earlier and I got my snake out and I took care of this thing. So those are all those little wins that I'm like, hey, I, I can do these things. Um, and if I was drinking, I'd be on the couch and I would pretend that the washing machine didn't exist. <laughs> so um, you know, all those fears, those irrational fears, um, you, when you finally make the decision to get sober, I think they're not as big as we think that, that, that we make them out to be. Um, and it's amazing what we all can conquer once we're sobri when, once we're sober. Absolutely. You know, I look back and I say, oh my gosh, all these things I was afraid of. I kind of laugh at it now because it seems so ridiculous in hindsight, right? It was like, wow, like what was I thinking? But we know that, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction is also a thinking disorder. Mm. Uh, you know, we're not thinking clearly and we don't think clearly. So that reframing of that thinking in sobriety is so important. Guys, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I know I've learned a lot and I hope everybody that's listening, you know, got a takeaway from this. I think would everybody you know say that making that decision definitely worth it in their life? Best definitely decision. worth it. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So 100%. you guys. <laughs> Make of that what you will. Uh, guys, thanks so much for coming on the Recovered Life Show. If you are making that decision right now and you don't feel like you want to do it alone, there's three amazing coaches here up on the stage. We're going to put links to how you get in touch with them and you can set up a free call and just have a chat with them and discuss, is it worth it? What did what was their experience like? I One of the great things about these Recovered Life coaches is that they're very compassionate, really good listeners and give really great direction if you want to make that decision to get sober to give you the best chance possible so we'll put all those links there i'd like to thank all of you for coming up uh and and joining us today uh jeff holly jennifer thank you guys so much for coming on the recovered life show good seeing you. you keep the conversation going join recovered life a community of like-minded people who are looking to live their best recovered lives Membership is free and you can apply at recoveredlife.us.